Walkington and uh, Robert Russell. My warmest thanks to them uh, for being involved this evening. Uh, Robert normally lives across the road from me, but he's actually beaming in from Scotland, where he has to go for three months every year just to top up his <laughs> Scottish and, accent. Uh, so if you could mute, please, if, if you're not actually taking part, that would be absolutely great. Well, look, there's so much poetry and prose that we know only through musical settings of them. Hearing the words naked as we did there can be rather uh, disconcerting. On the other hand, we can savour the words all the better without the distraction of the music. After all, one of the other songs of travel has Robert Louis Stevenson's words making the distinction between saying and singing. The right is the ring of words when the right man rings them. Fair the fall of songs when the singer sings them. Well, it's an obvious thing to say, I know, but we need to remember that before composers wrote their musical settings, they were attracted by the words alone. And maybe, maybe this evening we can recapture just a little that moment when Vaughan Williams thought, I've got to write music for that. He was, after all, a passionate devourer of poetry and prose all his life. Much of the time you'll be hearing text that attaches to well-known Vaughan Williams works, but if the music isn't known to you, then maybe hearing the words will make you want to get to know the music. More now from a sea symphony featuring the vibrant poetry of the 19th century American poet Walt Whitman. Vaughan Williams' love affair with, Whit with Whitman endured across his working life, and you can guess why. Whitman's poetry is so physical, so spontaneous, so free, so direct, that it knocks you sideways. Does it sound more like prose than poetry? Well, who cares? The words are so musical, they beg to have music written for them. Today, a rude, brief recitative of ships sailing the seas, each with its special flag or ship signal, of unnamed heroes in the ships, of waves spreading and spreading far as the eye can reach, of dashing spray and the winds piping and blowing, and out of these a chant for the sailors of all nations, fitful like a surge of sea captains, young or old, and the mates, and of all intrepid sailors, of the few, very choice, taciturn, whom fate can never surprise, nor death dismay, picked sparingly without noise by thee, old ocean, chosen by thee, thou sea, that pickest and cullest the race in time, and unitest nations, suckled by thee, old husky nurse, embodying thee, indomitable, untamed as thee. Thank you, Sandy. Well, Whitman held a special attraction to those of the younger generation on both sides of the Atlantic. Age-old conventions and beliefs were being challenged. Traditional verse forms were being adapted and rethought by other poets. But Whitman just blew the doors off convention. He set poetry free. In a sea, a sea symphony, the wonderful descriptive language puts us in touch with the dramatic development of international shipping in the later 19th century. And human progress is the focus of the last movement of the symphony. Vaughan Williams chose words by Whitman that were inspired by the opening of the Suez Canal in, uh, 18, in the 1870s. The canal, a prime symbol for human ingenuity. Whitman embraced religion in his own idiosyncratic fashion, but you can see why his ideas on human progress appealed to Vaughan Williams as an avowed atheist in his younger days. If the idea of God is dead to you, perhaps you put your faith in the indomitable, ingenious human spirit. Oh, my brave soul. So that's the mood of the words you'll hear from the last movement of the symphony. And before that, Whitman's wonderful evocation of a ship riding the waves in unruly weather, set by Vaughan Williams as his scherzo. And first, though, Robert, with words from the second movement 
a very different maritime perspective from a beach at night, Whitman gazing at the stars as he often did and coming over all philosophical about the nature of life and the universe. Popular astronomy was becoming very much the thing in the later 19th century. So off we go, Robert. On the beach at night alone, as the old mother sways her to and fro, singing her husky song. As I watch the bright stars shining, I think a thought of the cleft of the universes and of the future. A vast similitude interlocks all, all distances of space, however wide, all distances of time, all souls, all living bodies, they, they, they be ever so different. All nations, all identities that have existed or may exist, all lives and deaths, all of the past, present, future. This vast similitude spans them and always has spanned and shall forever span them and compactly hold and enclose them. After the sea ship, after the whistling winds, after the white gray sails taut to their spars and ropes, below a myriad, myriad waves hastening, lifting up their necks, tending in ceaseless flow toward the track of the ship, Waves of the ocean bubbling and gurgling, blithely prying, waves, undulating waves, liquid, uneven, emulous waves toward that whirling current, laughing and buoyant with curves, where the great vessel, sailing and tacking, displaced the surface. Larger and smaller waves in the spread of the ocean, yearnfully flowing, the wake of the sea ship after she passes, flashing and frolicsome under the sun, a motley procession with many a fleck of foam and many fragments following the stately and rapid ship in the wake following. Oh, we can wait no longer. We too take ship, O oh soul. Joyous we too launch out on trackless seas, fearless for unknown shores on waves of ecstasy to sail. Amid the wafting winds, thou pressing me to thee, I to thee, I thee to me, O soul, caroling free, singing our song of God, chanting our chant of pleasant exploration. Away, O soul, hoist instantly the anchor, cut the hawsers, haul out, shake out every sail, sail forth, steer for the deep waters only. Reckless, O soul, exploring, I with thee and thou with me, for we are bound where Mariner has not yet dared to go, and we will risk the ship, ourselves and all. Oh, my brave soul, oh, father, father, sail. Well, A. E. Hausmann offered Vaughan Williams a pessimistic and fatalistic take on atheism. 
Houseman Shropshire Lad poems were published in 1896 and after a slow start acquired cult status, especially with the younger generation. The poems reflected a widespread mood of nostalgia for Britain's traditional rural life as it was rapidly vanishing. But surely this verse also gave expression to the draining away of religious belief from the lives of so many, Vaughan Williams included. He was also an avid reader of Thomas Hardy and Matthew Arnold, who both embraced that same mood of stone cold fatalism. So words now from two of Vaughan Williams' houseman settings in the On Wenlock Edge song cycle, first performed in 1909. We're face to face with the impermanence of life and the fragility of love. From far, from eve and morning, and yon twelve-winded sky, the stuff of life to knit me blew hither. Here am I. <coughs> now for a breath I tarry, nor yet disperse apart. Take my hand, quick, and tell me, what have you in your heart? Speak now, and I will answer. How shall I help you? Say, Ere to the wind's twelve quarters, I take my endless way. In summertime on Bredon, the bells they sound so clear. Round both the shires they ring them in steeples far and near, a happy noise to hear. Here of a Sunday morning, my love and I would lie and see the coloured counties and hear the locks so high about us in the sky. The bells would ring to call her in valleys miles away. Come all to church, good people, good people, come and pray. But here my love would stay and I would turn and answer among the springing time. Oh, peal upon our wedding, and we will hear the chime and come to church in time. But when the snows at Christmas on bread and top were strown, my love rose up so early and stole out unbeknown and went to church alone. They told the one bell only, groom there was none to see. The mourners followed after, and so to church went she and would not wait for me. The bells they sound on Bredon and still the steeples hum. Come all to church, good people. Oh, noisy bells, be dumb. I hear you, I will come. But when the snows at Christmas on Breen and Top were strong, my love rose up so early and stole out on I'm sure you'll uh, recognise there in that uh, wonderful recording, 1960s, I think, wasn't it? Well, never mind the atheistic fatalism. Vaughan Williams agrees in 1904 to be the music editor of the English hymnal. He writes all manner of church music. After all, his upbringing was rooted in Anglican church worship. The lack of a personal belief didn't stop Vaughan Williams appreciating quality religious literature. He certainly believed you could be spiritual without being religious. And so to John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's 
progress. This was a staple of Vaughan Williams's childhood reading, which made him a typical child of his generation and many generations before. Yes, Pilgrim's Progress is packed with Christian doctrine, but it's also just a great story told in evocative language. Well, the culmination of Vaughan Williams's passion for Pilgrim's Progress was the full-scale opera, or morality as he called it, which was first formed in 1951. So here we are in Act Four, Pilgrim not so far now from the delectable mountains from where he'll get a sight of the celestial city. He comes across a woodcutter's boy and then Mr. Byens from the town of Fair Speech uh, appears, yet another character reflecting Bunyan's scorn for ungodly personality types. Uh, the term Byens implied a certain self-centered character. We'll hear Francis as the woodcutter's boy, Sandy as Christian stroke pilgrim, and myself cast to type perhaps as Mr. Byens. We've lost you, Francis, unmute. He uh, that is down. Uh, sorry, Francis, just before you start, we've still got somebody, I think, who, whose uh, sound is leaking in. If you could uh, mute yourselves, bottom left-hand corner of your screen, if, if I've, you're not. I've been looking for one that's unmuted and I can't spot it. Ah. Uh, I, I will go on looking and I can mute okay. them. Yeah. That's fine. Sorry about that. Off we go, Francis. Pilgrim's Progress. Yeah. He that is down need fear no fall. He that is low no pride. He that is humble ever shall have God to be his guide. Hark to what that boy doth sing. I would dare to say he leads a merrier life and wears more of the herb called heartsies in his bosom than he that is clad in silk and velvet. I am content with what I have, little it be or much. And Lord, contentment still I crave, because thou savest such. Good day, friend. How now? How now? Whither away, pilgrim? I am bound for the celestial city. Have I still far to go? Not far. Far from here, where the day is clear, you can see the delectable mountains, and then your journey is nearly at an end. But look, here comes one who would gladly share your pilgrimage. What, countryman, sir? And whither are you going? I come from the town of Fair Speech. Fair Speech? Is there any good that lives there? I hope so. And I have many kindred in the town, but in particular, my lord Turnabout, my lord Time Server, also Mr. Smooth Man, Mr. Facing Both Ways, and the parson of our parish, Mr. Two Tongues. But to tell you the truth, I am become a gentleman of quality, yet my father was a waterman, looking one way and rowing another. It runs in my mind that this is one Mr. Byens of fair speech. Ask him. Methinks he should not be ashamed of his name. Is not your name Mr. Byens of fair speech? Well, that is not my name. It is a nick name that is given me by some that cannot abide me. I must be content to bear it as a reproach, as other good men have borne theirs before me. Yet... You shall find me a fair company keeper if you will admit me your associate. If you would go with me, you must go against the wind and tide. You must own religion in his rags and stand by him too when bound in irons. Not a step further unless you will do as I do in what I propose. I will never desert my old principles, since they are harmless and profitable. If I may not go with you, I must e'en go by myself, till some overtake me that will be glad of my company. Your servant. 
If this man cannot stand before the judgment of men, how shall he stand before the judgment of God? But now give me God's speed, for I must go on my way. God's speed. Yonder are the delectable mountains, a most pleasant mountainous country, beautiful with woods and vineyards and fruits of every sort, with springs and fountains, very delectable to behold. Come fair, come foul. I long to be there, for then I shall be in the haven where I would be. Farewell. I wish you a fair day when you set out for Mount Zion. Fullness to such a burden is that go on pilgrimage. Here little and hereafter bliss is best from age to age. So as John Noble as Pilgrim. Well, back to the real world now, to the British agricultural scene on either side of 1900. So many rural areas were suffering under the decades long depression that had the countryside uh, in its grip. Through the, throughout the 19th, uh, through the 19th century, there'd been a steady flow of farm workers into urban areas, and now it was becoming a flood. And there was a mood of concern in many circles at the disappearance of country trades and crafts, traditions, folk song, Vaughan Williams's particular interest, of course, and dialects were disappearing. And concern about this is reflected in Vaughan Williams's settings of three Dorset dialect poems by the clergyman poet William Barnes, first published in the 1870s. One is the famous Lyndon Lee, but here are the words of Blackmore by the Stour. Uh, please note that a cloat is a water lily, a tun is a chimney, and Palador is an old name for Shaftesbury. Uh, you will excuse me that I now have to channel my inner Walter Gabriel, and I'm not quite sure how it's going to come out. But let's see. Let's have a go. The primrose in the shade do blow, the cowslip in the sun, the thyme upon the down do grow, the cloat where streams do run. And where do pretty maidens grow and blow? But where the tower do rise among the brigand tons, in Blackmoor, by the stour. If you could see their comely gait and pretty faces smiles, a tripping on so light a weight and stepping off the stiles. <laughs> Again to church as bells do swing and ring in the tower, you would own the pretty maiden's place is Blackmore by the star. If you from Wimborne took your way, to Stour or Palador, and all the farmers' houses showed their daughters at the door. You'd cry to bachelors at home, Here I come, within an hour, you'll find ten maidens to your mind, in Blackmore, by the Stour. And if you looked it in their door to see them in their place, a doing housework up avore their smiling mother's face, You'd cry, why, if a man would wive and thrive without a dower, 
than letting looking out a wife in Blackmore by the stour. Well, don't know how that came out. Um, I'm sorry, we're not going to listen to there is a recording of, of that, but we really must rush on. I don't want to be compared with somebody getting it right, perhaps, is the answer there. Anyway, like great numbers of urban dwellers before and after the Great War, Vaughan Williams needed to escape regularly to the countryside. Exploring and experiencing nature was now akin to a religion for many. They were taken out of town by train or if you lived in London, by underground, or you sped out on the newfangled bicycle. It was, let's break free from heartless urbanization and rediscover the glories of the countryside. And it's this spirit that inhabits Robert Louis Stevenson's 1896 Songs of Travel poems, nine of which were set to music by Vaughan Williams in the early years of the 20th century. Still very popular today, of course, well, here are the pleasures of the open road, simple pleasures that are beyond price. Six of the nine songs of travel poems, though, reflect uh, Vaughan Williams's, uh, find Vaughan Williams referencing the sky, not least the night sky. And that's another reflection, perhaps, of that growing interest in astronomy. So before we have a five minute break, three of the songs of travel as set by Vaughan Williams. The Vagabond. Give to me the life I love. Let the lathe go by me. Give the jolly heaven above and the byway nigh me. Bed in the bush with stars to see. Bread I dip in the river. There's the life for a man like me. There's the life forever. Let the blow fall soon or late. Let what will be o'er me. Give the face of earth around and the road before me. Wealth I seek not, hope nor love, nor a friend to know me. All I seek, the heaven above and the road below me. Or let autumn fall on me where afield I linger, silencing the bird on tree, biting the blue finger. White as meal the frosty field, warm the fireside haven. Not to autumn will I yield, not to winter even. Let the blow fall soon or late, let what will be o'er me. Give the face of earth around and the road before me. Wealth I ask not, hope nor love, nor a friend to know me. All I ask, the heaven above and the road below me. The infinite shining heavens. The infinite shining heavens rose and I saw in the night uncountable angel stars showering sorrow and light. I saw them distant as heaven, dumb and shining and dead. And the idle stars of the night were dearer to me than bread. Night after night in my sorrow, the stars stood over the sea, till lo, I looked in the dusk, and a star had come down to me. The Roadside Fire I will make you brooches and toys for your delight Of birdsong at morning and starshine at night. I will make a palace fit for you and me Of green days in forests and blue days at sea. I will make my kitchen and you shall keep your room where white flows the river and bright blows the broom. And you shall wash your linen and keep your body white in rainfall at morning and dewfall at night. 
And this shall be for music when no one else is near, the fine song for singing, the rare song to hear that only I remember, that only you admire of the broad road that stretches and the roadside fire. I will make you brooches and toys for your delight of bird song and morning and starshine at night. I will make a palace fit for you and me of green days in forest and blue. And you shall keep your room Where white flows the river And bright blows the broom And you shall wash your linen And keep your body white In rainfall at morning And you fall at night Incomparable John Shirley Quirk. I think that might have been his first ever recording. Um, I talked with him about it once, and it was recorded in what was virtually just a laundry cupboard. Uh, I didn't have uh, the, 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 the money for a proper studio, and uh, it was done under very trying circumstances. But you just wouldn't guess from that, would you? What a wonderful, wonderful interpretation of that, as of all the other songs of travel from John Shirley Quirk. Fair enough. Before we move on, I just want to say a special thank you to Francis. Um, you've noted the gender balance of the readers is a little bit top heavy towards us blokes. This was not what was intended in the first place. We lost we lost somebody, I'm afraid, at, at uh, rather late notice. And so there's had to be a redistribution of, of readings basically between Francis and myself. I wasn't going to be reading as much as I am reading this evening. Uh, but thanks very much, Francis, for being a real brick and actually taking on more than you were, you were intended to do. So let us uh, move on, and I've got to channel some other inner something here. I'm not quite sure what. Um, if you've got uh, the text in front of you, you'll perhaps know where this is from, but otherwise I'll tell you afterwards. Tell you I will, if that you will a while be still, of a comely Jill that dwelt on a hill. She is somewhat sage and well-worn in age. For her visage, it would assuage a man's courage. Droopy and drowsy, scurvy and lousy, her face all bowsy, comely crinkled, wondrously wrinkled, like a roast pig's ear bristled with hair. Her nose, some deal hooked and camously crooked, never stopping, but ever dropping. Her skin, loose and slack, grained like a sack with a crooked back jawed like a jetty. A man would have pity to see how she is gummed, fingered and thumbed, gently jointed, greased and anointed, up to the knuckles, like as they were with buckles together made fast. Her youth is far past, and yet she will jet like a jolly vet in her furred flocket and grey russet rocket with simper and cocket. Her hood of Lincoln green, it has been hers, I ween, more than forty year, and so doth it appear, for the green bare thread is, like, look like sere weed is, with like hay, the wool worn away. And yet, I dare say, she thinketh herself, he thinketh herself gay, upon the holiday, when she doth her array, and girdeth on her geats, stitch and pranked with pleats. Her kirtle, bristol red, with clothes upon her head that weigh a sow of lead, writhen in wondrous wise after the Saracen's guise. With a whim-wham, knit with a trim-tram, upon her brain-pan, like an Egyptian, capped about when she goeth out. And this comely dame, I understand, her name is Eleanor Rumming. 
at home in her wanning. And as men say, she dwelt in Surrey, in a certain stead, beside Leatherhead. She is a tunnish jib, the devil and she be sib. But to make up my tale, she breweth nappy ale, and maketh thereof hot sail to travellers, to tinkers, to sweaters, to swinkers, and all good ale drinkers that will nothing spare, but drink till they stare and bring themselves bare with, now away the mare and let us slay care, as wise as an hare. Come, whoso will, to Eleanor on the hill with, fill the cup, fill, and sit there by still, early and late. Thither cometh Kate, Cicely, and Sarah, with their legs bare. They run in all haste, unbraced and unlaced, with their heels dagged, their kirtles all jagged, their smocks all too ragged. With titters and tatters, bring dishes and platters, with all their might running to Eleanor rumming, to have of her tunning. that Vormilliams could exhibit a very earthy sense of humour. Words from the first of the five Tudor portraits, the Ballad of Eleanor Rumming, words by the 15th, 16th century poet uh, John Skelton. Well, at the first performance of the Tudor portraits in the late 1930s, uh, the bawdy texts turned the Countess of Albemarle ever more purple. Uh, she then walked out with a loud dis disgusting. And Vaughan Williams said it was a good job she hadn't seen the lines he didn't set. Well, in stark contrast to that, Vaughan Williams and war. We were bound to get round to that sooner or later. In the Great War, uh, he served both as an ambulance driver on the Somme in 1916, and strangely less remarked upon as a commissioned officer on the Western Front in 1918. He witnessed the brutality of the conflict from the inside, but barely talked about his experiences to anyone. So studying the music he wrote in the post-Great War years is vital in the search for clues about how he came to terms with what he'd witnessed. Let's then hear a collation of words sung by the character Moria in the short opera Riders to the Sea, written in the 1920s, but not performed into the until the later 1930s. Uh, Vaughan Williams' friend and biographer Michael Kennedy reckoned that Riders is uh, one of the composer's six most important works. Well, Vaughan Williams set the text of J.M. Singh's 1904 play Riders to the Sea. We're with the fishing community on the Aran Islands off the west coast of Ireland, for the story of how the cruel, impersonal sea does away with Moria's sons one after another. Well, you have to believe, I think, that Vaughan Williams sees this as a metaphor for the Great War experience of parents losing son after son to the conflict. And many soldiers' bodies, of course, were never found, hundreds of thousands of them. So listen out for the phrase from Moria about her dead sons some of them were found and some of them were not found. Well, we join the opera uh, just as the latest tragedy, the death of Bartley, has hit Moria. Bartley will be lost now. And let you call in Eamon and make me a good coffin out of the whiteboards, for I won't live after them. 
I've had a husband and a husband's father and six sons in this house. Six fine men, though it was a hard birth I had with every one of them. And they come into the world and some of them were found and some of them were not found. But they're gone now, a lot of them. There were Stephen and Sean were lost in the great wind and found after in the Bay of Gregory of the Golden Mouth and carried up the two of them on the one plank and in by that door. There were Seamus and his father and his own father again were lost in a dark night and not a stick or sign was seen of them when the sun went up. There was Patch after was drowned out of a curra that turned over. I was sitting here with Bartley and he a baby lying on my two knees. And I seen two women and three women and four women coming in and they crossing themselves and not saying a word. I looked out then and there were men coming after them and, and they holding a thing in the half of a red sail and water dripping out of it. It was a dry day, Nora, and leaving a track to the door. They're all gone now and there isn't anything more the sea can do to me. I'll have no call now to be up crying and praying when the wind breaks from the south and you can hear the surf is in the east and the surf is in the west making a great stir with the two noises and they hitting one on the other. I'll have no call now to be going down and getting holy water in the dark nights and I won't care what way the sea is when the other women will be keening. They're all together this time and the end is come. May the almighty God have mercy on Bartley's soul and on Michael's soul and on the souls of Seamus and Patch and Stephen and Sean. And may he have mercy on my soul, Nora, and on the soul of everyone is left living in the world. Thanks, Francis, very, very much for that very, very moving reading. Um, I was scrambling around trying to find um, which recording that was. And uh, it sounds a bit like Janet Baker, but it, it isn't. And I don't know if every, very, anybody here more knowledgeable than myself knows who that was. It wasn't Linda Finney, was it, by any chance? Anyway, we'll, we'll uh, do some further exploration on that. Well, no shortage of emotion in words or music there, but we don't perhaps readily associate Vaughan Williams with a deep romantic passion. We've had hints of that though previously this evening. And in her biography of Vaughan Williams, his second wife, Ursula, comments on his shyness, but also says he was always very romantically susceptible, was her phrase. Well, 15 years ago, at the 50th anniversary of Vaughan Williams's death, uh, there was much hoo-ha, you may remember it, about John Bridcutt's TV documentary, The Passions of Vaughan Williams, Romantic Passions, that is. It's far too big a subject uh, to tackle now, but it does seem clear that while Vaughan Williams's relationship with his first wife, Adeline, was fruitful and successful in very many respects, it was short on romance. So it's interesting to consider the intimate and, yes, passionate words of two of the poems by Dante Gabriel 
uh, Gabriel Rossetti, which Vaughan Williams chose to set in his House of Life cycle from 1904, just a few years after his marriage to Adeline. Uh, the second poem inspired by one of the uh, inspired one of the very best of all Vaughan, Vaughan Williams's songs. So this is uh, Sandy, please. Love sight. When do I see thee most, beloved one? When in the light, the spirits of mine eyes, before thy face, their altar, solemnized the worship of that love through thee made known? Or when in the dusk hours, we two alone, close kissed and eloquent of still replies, thy twilight hidden glimmering visage lies, and my soul only sees thy soul, its own. O oh, love, my love, if I no more should see thyself, nor on the earth the shadow of thee, nor image of thine eyes in any spring, how then should sound upon life's darkening slope the ground whirl of the perished leaves of hope, the wind of death's imperishable wing. Silent noon. Your hands lie open in the long fresh grass. The finger points look through like rosy blooms. Your eyes smile peace. The pasture gleams and glooms neath billowing clouds that scatter and amass. All round our nest, far as the eye can pass, are golden kingcup fields with silver edge, where the cow parsley skirts the hawthorn hedge. Tis visible silence still as the hourglass. Deep in the sun search growths the dragonfly, hangs like a blue thread loosened from the sky. So this winged hour is dropped to us from above. Oh, clasp we to our hearts for deathless dower, this close companion, inarticulate hour, when twofold silence was the song of love. <laughs> So frustrating to have to keep on fading the music, but uh, we must keep to time. That was Thomas Allen, of course. Well, it seems very unlikely that Vaughan Williams strayed further than flirtation and warm working relation, re relationships with women. But that all changed in the course of one day, one lunch in 1938, the day he met the 27-year-old poet and author Ursula Wood. And immediately, immediately, it was instant click, I think was the phrase that she used. It was clear that she and Rafe were simply on the same intellectual, emotional and physical wavelength. Even so, there were many ups and downs during the 13 years that uh, Adeline Vaughan Williams still had to live. And when she died in 1951, it wasn't certain that Rafe and Ursula would marry. Anyway, let's hear a couple of uh, romantic poems by Ursula to represent the fruit of this ultimately immensely fulfilling relationship. Just two examples from the significant body of Ursula's writings, which Rafe set to music. We have Menelaus on the beach at Pharos, a wonderful symbol for their relationship. The poem inspired by the Odyssey, 
uh, by the image of Helen of Troy awaiting the return after long journeyings of her husband, King Menelaus, one of the heroes of the Trojan Wars. And the second poem, Tired, just the simplest of expressions of contented love. Menelaus on the beach at Pharos. You will come home, not to the home you knew that your thought remembers, going from rose to rose along the terraces and staying to gaze at the vines and iris beside the lake in the morning haze. Forgetting the place you are in where the cold sea winds go, crying like gulls on the beach where horned sea poppies grow. Homesick wanderer, you will come home to a home more ancient waiting your return. Sea frets the steps that lie green under waves and swallows nest below lintel and eaves. There lamps are kindled for you. They will burn till you come, however late you come, till the west wind's sheltering wing folds round your sail and brings you to land. Stretch out your hand. Murmuring, lapping sea, and the lamps and the welcome wait to draw you home to rest. You shall come home, and love shall fold you in joy and lay your heart on her breast. Tired. Sleep. And I'll be still as another sleeper holding you in my arms. Glad that you lie so near at last. This sheltering midnight is our meeting place. No passion or despair or hope divide me from your side. I shall remember firelight on your sleeping face. I shall remember shadows growing deeper as the fire fell to ashes and the minutes passed. This sheltering midnight is our meeting place. No passion or despair or hope divide me from your side. lovely lovely song um i found that uh clip music clip about five years ago and I, again i've completely lost the note of who it is it's not a voice i, I recognize but one of you may well know who that is but great to have that recording so barely any recordings of, of it well let's end with statements of vaughan williams belief in music as a unique language he always insisted he was never going to explain what his music meant. For him, music was far too individual a language to be tethered by mere clumsy words. He'd get quite frosty with people who argue the toss over this. And we access here Vaughan Williams's lifelong love of Shakespeare. First, the words from the play Henry VIII, the 1903 song Orpheus with his lute. And then the words of Lorenzo in uh, The Merchant of Venice, uh, we hear those words in Vaughan Williams' wonderful serenade to music from 1938. And we can guess that there's something of Ursula in this. They've just met when this is being composed. 
Orpheus with his lute made trees, and the mountain tops that freeze bow themselves when he did sing. To his plants, sorry, to his music, plants and flowers ever sprung as sun and showers. There had made a lasting spring. Everything that heard him play, even the billows of the sea, hung their heads and then lay by. In sweet music is such art, killing care and grief of heart, fall asleep or hearing die. How sweet the moonlight sleeps upon this bank. Here will we sit and let the sounds of music creep in our ears. Soft stillness and the night become the touches of sweet harmony. Look how the floor of heaven is thick inlaid with patterns of bright gold. There's not the smallest orb that thou beholdst, but in his motion, like an angel sings, still quiring to the young-eyed cherubins. Such harmony is in immortal souls. But whilst this muddy vesture of decay doth grossly close it in, we cannot hear it. Come, ho, and wake Diana with a hymn. With sweetest touches, pierce your mistress's ear and draw her home with music. Uh, Adrian Bolt conducting 16 soloists in the 1970s, the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Well, look, history has just been made. I know we started a bit late, but we have still finished precisely on time. I don't know how we managed that. It's the first event I've ever been involved in or had control of where things have finished on time. Um, a huge thanks, first of all, to Francis, to Sandy, and to Robert, I'm really, really grateful to you. And I hope you in enjoyed that. It's, uh, it's um, you know, I think all of us just love reading poetry. Uh, uh, but I shall remember your Moria for a long, long time, Francis. Uh, you know, it's just a wonderful, wonderful reading. John, you've had a difficult evening with the tech, but you've carried on manfully. And we're really, really grateful to you. Thanks very, very much indeed. We got through and to time, John. So nobody can argue with that. Thanks for, we've had one or two comments there. Uh, I did indeed call Vaughan Williams an ambulance driver and I, my wrists need slapping for that. It sort of slipped out, but thank you, Andrew, for mentioning that. And it seems to be that the soloist in Riders was either Helen Watts, uh, Ron sort of should know, uh, but you have got a question mark there, Ron. Do you wanna have another go or Helen Watts is your last, your last offer? Uh, but Sarah Walker, uh, as seems this look there's a more definitive look to the placement of Sarah Walker in, in not, the not not Heather Harper. Uh, no. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Any advance? I will I will find out. And if, if you want to know, I will put it through channels where you can find it. But I, I don't know if anybody now you can unmute yourselves if you, you want to comment on you know exactly what it felt like to listen to the to to the poetry what you gained from that um uh, you know I, I don't know what your observations might be but it'd be interesting to hear what you you've got to say i mean you don't have to say it now you can always send us an email but anybody got any comment to make
And I just say, as a reader, that it was extraordinary actually hearing the words and then seeing what um, Rafe mm. had done with them. And actually really very moving because one just sat and thought, wow, I mean, the empathy there was just huge. And he, you, you really felt that he got inside the um, poems and, um, and bits of writing, you know, just, it was just, I was fascinated by it, I must confess. And I, I am embarrassingly, apart from the English hymnal, I am embarrassingly ignorant of um, Vaughan Williams. I probably shouldn't say that in this august company. Well, you see, you and Robert you know, basically said the same thing to me beforehand. And I said, well, look, it's an advantage that you don't know the, the music. You'll just take it as as text and read it as, as it is. And, you know, that's absolutely fine. I mean, it's, it's very easy to get infected by your knowledge of the music and play out the rhythms as you know them in, in the music. You need to rid yourself of that and just see it as poetry. Any other comments? I mean, maybe particular poems uh, or readings, that, readings you, that you really enjoy. Really enjoy. Andrew, I appreciate the context into which you put this poetry. Really, really nice. Uh, I, I, I wondered whether I, whether I, I, I should, David, have, have um, uh, well, it, I, perhaps it was a, a, going a little bit too far for an evening like this. I wondered if I should, should have commented more ab ab about, it, uh, about exactly how Vaughan Williams set the text and what precisely he saw them make it a little bit more sort of musical. But I think it was best just to leave it as, as text and then let you hear those short clips. I think Vaughan Williams would smile on hearing the poetry without the music and then hearing the music and being so moved by it. Yeah. I, you, you just can't get better than that. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Well, no, thanks very much indeed. I mean, this is not a, a completely original idea. I mean, if you look online, you'll see this sort of thing has been done before. But in a way, um, you wonder why it isn't done, done more often. Uh, I, I found it very, very enriching. I've done it once before at Leith Hill Place with a fair amount of, of this, and it was just a wonderful, wonderful evening. And it wasn't just me that was saying that; it was the people that that, that were there. Um, there's a, wondering if there's, uh, you know, it was my choice of readings. I was just wondering if there's anything that people wished had been been there that that wasn't. I mean, you're you're on a hiding to nothing. Uh, mm -hmm choosing your own favorite favorite words but that was just my choice some of the I, I did give you a hint earlier andrew yeah oh remind me john uh, we're saying this the the Fred, the Fredigan shove those are those are songs aren't they um all the breath of the bloom of the year in the bag oh. of the yes oh i still got it somewhere um oh I, well i think you're gonna have to read it uh, john was very kind he sent me the first text that vaughan williams ever set i think it only uh, uh, the music for it only exists in manuscript is that right well look john it's your chance to shine so unmute yourself and read us that text it's robert browning is it's extraordinary piece No, you're, you need to unmute yourself. There we are. Right. All the breath and the bloom of the year in the bag of one bee, all the wonder and wealth of the mine in the heart of one gem, in the core of one pearl, all the shade and the shine of the sea, breath and bloom, shade and shine, wonder, wealth and how far above them, truth that's brighter than gem, trust that's purer than pearl, brightest truth, purest trust in the universe, all were for me in the kiss of one girl. Well, we'll certainly be calling you. <laughs> uh, and all that alliteration. Uh, but the, again, there's sort of romantic susceptibilities in there at, at, at the end. Right. Again, absolutely fascinating. Well, thank you very much for for, for sharing that. It's absolutely brilliant. Well, look, I said it would end at uh, at a quarter past nine. We're now seven minutes over. Uh, perhaps that basically is it. And anybody else got any comments they'd wish to make? I was just going to suggest that the only one I missed was 
was George Herbert, who has yeah. got to be the most unlikely combination with Rayfon Williams. No, I, I get given given the given, the, given the, the 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 color of his religious persuasion. I suspect what what is what you mean there. Well, uh, right. when I did the, when I did this at Leith Hill Place, um, a Leith Hill Place, we had twenty minutes to ingest lots of cake and champagne and all that sort of stuff. So we were able to keep going longer, basically. Uh, but I did indeed have have I think two readings from the five mystical songs. So you're absolutely right. I mean, it was it was very much in my mind to do that, but I just had to make the the choice that we possibly had a bit too much romantic sensibility this evening but who cares who cares we'll we'll be a bit more sparing next time if we do it again it was wonderful well thanks very much indeed great that you all came um thank you very very much indeed um i'll start and, to- and a big thank you to you andrew as well for kind of putting it all together and rehearsing us very good well i'm uh, i'm sorry you yeah. heard quite so much of 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 my voice um, uh, I, I thought somebody had to put their hand up and, and do Blackmoor or Aboida Star. Or I don't think I would have liked that thrown at me at the last moment. So I put my hand up there, certainly. But thank you very much for that, Francis. Always a pleasure to have you along at these things. Uh, so uh, there will be another another one of these, I guess, in December. And I'll try and do something different. Maybe we'll have a star interview. Simply, simply that for the evening. I don't know. But so if you've got any ideas, something you'd like in this sort of setting, then just let me know and I'll be, be delighted to do whatever I can to make that work. So uh, just one final thing, the Paul Williams Society, uh, rvwsociety.com, I think is, is the website. If you've been encouraged to actually get closer to the Paul Williams Society, there's all sorts of stuff on there, biography, music, concerts coming up, publications, all that sort of stuff, rvwsociety.com. And that's it. Good night. Thank you so much for coming. Bye for now.